Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation and the Cleon Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Good evening. And welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Brian King, minority leader in the Utah House of Representatives, Nicole Nixon, political reporter with KUER, and Todd Weiler, Republican member of the Utah State Senate. So glad to have you all here with us today. I see you on the Hill every day. Nicole's following it. You two are making the laws, and we have some laws to talk about today. Uh, Representative King, let's start with you. Uh, an issue that's being discussed even this very day is Medicaid expansion. Right. Voters had an idea about what should happen with expansion. Legislators are working on some bills. Give us a status report of SB 96 as it stands now. Well, right now, uh, as we record this, we're about ready to go into the floor debate in the House on what was passed in the Senate. And it's interesting to see that the representatives in the House uh, on both sides of the aisle have disagreement with what came out of the Senate. So you're going to see uh, a substitute bill, um, and it will be debated today, this morning on the House floor. I've spoken to the Speaker, and he indicates that he's going to give generous time for that, 45 minutes to an hour at least, for the debate. So we're looking forward to having a good airing on that. What, what do you think the substitute bill is? Well, the substitute bill moves us closer to what Proposition 3 was and is, as it was passed by the voters in November, than what came out of the Senate. So as a Democrat, I'm happy with that in the, as a matter of policy. But I still have real concerns about us making significant substantive changes to Proposition 3, as I think is uh, going to be in the substitute bill that we debate today. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, Senator Weiler, so we had a no vote from the Republicans yesterday. Yeah. It, it was you. Yeah. Yeah. So t talk about that and why. Well, Prop 3 passed in my Senate district. It passed statewide. Um, the, 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 the bill that the Senate passed to the House said that if we don't get the waiver, and we've never gotten the waiver before, we've tried this, we've been down this road before, then all of Prop 3 is repealed. And so there was no way I was going to vote for that. The, the, the bill that comes out of the House today will basically say if we don't get the waiver, then we'll try for a second waiver, and then we'll implement uh, Prop 3 with some minor tweaks that are kind of what Ray Ward's bill does. So. Okay. So, so, Nicole, this, we've been down this road. We've been waiting for a while. On our request for a waiver. All right, so kind of give us the read on the Hill, uh, particularly from the voters' perspective that you're talking to about first the waiver and then the substitute that's coming. Right, so there are multiple parts of this bill that are different than what voters approved in November, right? You have uh, the work requirements are back in, you have these waivers that people aren't so sure about. We heard from the governor this week who gave us some insight into that, um, talking to Republican lawmakers. They've been very confident and they've said, we feel confident about getting these waivers and getting them fast, but that hasn't been the state's experience in the past, mm -hmm. right? We've requested waivers before and waited a year or more for them. Um, we did get some insight into why, why, where that confidence is coming from, though. The, uh, the governor said that he's had conversations with the, the Trump administration, with the CMS administrator, and um, with the Affordable Care Act being the, the law of the land for the foreseeable future, right? Um, I think the, the administration does feel more comfortable in div giving out waivers than they have been in the past. Is that what you're hearing, Representative King? Are they going to are they going to come through on this well, waiver for the state? There more there's more than one waiver. There's a waiver for the different components of the plan that don't comply with full Medicaid expansion, and so you may have some waivers given. For example, on work requirements, I think that there is a decent chance it's actually we'll get a waivers. Work effort. It's a very weak work effort. Yeah, it, 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 can stands. you explain that really quick while, while he's talking about what yeah, that? Yeah. So I, I think a lot of rep a lot of my colleagues um, they they don't want someone sitting in their mom's basement playing video games instead of working and and getting full, you know more government welfare, and so it's a work work effort, uh, the same as the work effort that we have uh, with food stamps right now. So it's a very, what I would call a very weak work requirement. And, and, so. and the federal government has shown some inclination to grant waivers with regard to those kind of work efforts in other states, so we may get that. What we're not likely, nearly as likely to get, in my humble opinion, is a waiver dealing with per capita caps. Mm -hmm. Uh, or a waiver dealing with moving 100% to up to 138% of federal poverty limit over to the exchange, so ma to the making those that group of people purchase health insurance on the exchange with under subsidies, the ACA. purchase with subsidies, with the, which with they're subsidies. already qualified for. That's right, but but those are those different waivers are not necessarily all going to be granted in the same fashion or all as readily granted. So the the point is. 
if you do have some waivers that are granted and some not, we're still back down to this 30-70 contribution level. And that's the thing that gives me, from a fiscal responsibility perspective, some real heartburn, is that what we're doing is setting up the taxpayers of the state of Utah to pay a much bigger share than they should if we just had full Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. That's not fiscally responsible from my and perspective. Jason, even though I voted no, we're getting a lot of emails. The advocates are putting out false information. Pregnant women are already covered. Uh, children are already covered. Elderly are already covered. Disabled adults are already covered. What we're talking about with this population is able-bodied adults, and, th and that's why the, the work requirement is so important to, 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 certain, to certain legislative leaders. So One of the things that I think, too, Jason, that we're talking about that's important is uh, my Republican colleagues want to say, well, we're providing the same level of coverage for this group from 100% to 138% of the federal poverty level, uh, whether they're on the exchange or whether they're on full Medicaid expansion. I disagree with that. I think that the coverage that they're getting under full Medicaid expansion is much more advantageous to them than having to go out on the exchange and pay more out of pocket for it and get coverage that isn't as comprehensive and good for them as Medicaid expansion coverage would be. I will see, say we saw those, um, those insurance rates and what they might look like for people making between 12 and 16,000. So say you only make $15,000 a year, you still need to pay about between $4 and $20 a month for uh, insur your insurance premium. You still would need to pay $15 for cheap generic drugs, $10 for a doctor visit. Those could add up very quickly. If you have $15,000 a year and rent and groceries and a family to take care of, those costs add up very fast. Mm -hmm. but, but if you have a family to take care of, that, that the federal poverty level adjusts depending on the family size. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I want to get into a couple of these mechanics, but but Senator, I want to ask you a question too, because a lot of your colleagues and you know yours on your side of the aisle are watching this too, Representative King. Uh, they're trying to gauge the interests of the people who are voting for them. Yeah. We looked it up. Y your district. 51.4 percent of your of, of your constituents said we want Medicaid expansion. Yeah. How are you walking that line, and what are you hearing from your colleagues? Well, I mean, s some of my colleagues aren't running for re-election. Some of my colleagues are in districts where Medicaid expansion failed. So there's different categories of colleagues. So for me, I, you know, the way I looked at it was we've been tinkering around with Medicaid expansion for at least five years. Mm -hmm. We've failed. We, we've tried to get waivers before we failed. Uh, so, so elections have consequences, as President Obama said. And, and, and for me, it had a consequence. It passed in my district. So there were things included in Prop 3 that were not part of the ACA that I'm not sure the voters fully understood. So I would be okay with with, you know, like taking out the automatic increase for, for Medicaid providers, which is adding $40 million a year to the cost. I'd be okay with some of those things. And there were things that uh, that Prop 3 allowed, like a hospital assessment, that, that wasn't included in Prop 3. Like, uh, and, and, and so I would, I would be uh, in favor of some of those minor tweaks as long as we weren't, you know, reducing the eligibility population. Mm -hmm. But for me, that election had a big consequence, so. Okay, uh, Nicole, w w one final piece on this. So you're talking with the people in the neighborhoods that are watching the legislature closely. Give us a flavor for how closely the Utah public is watching this issue. I think they're watching it very closely. I mean, obviously, they can't be up there every day. They can't follow every single news story with every single development on every single thing the, the Republican leadership and the governor say on it. But I think what the general public sees is for the second time in the past few months, the legislature is coming in, changing a ballot initiative that the general public approved, and they do not like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's switch gears for just a moment. Uh, an interesting um, kind of letter was circulated this, this week, Representative King, we'll start with you, about the number of women now in the legislature. A list went out, 31 uh, women. In the who, history of the state. In the whole history of the state, asserted in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, the, let's talk about that for a second. We're about 24% of our legislature is now women. Talk about how that's impacting what's happening on the Hill now, and at the end, why we need even more women running for office. Oh, listen, I think this is a great topic. I am the leader of a caucus of 16 Democrats in the House, 12 of whom are women. Three quarters of our Democratic caucus in the House are women. And the same is true, about the same percentage, four out of six Democratic senators are women in our Utah State Legislature. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think it sends the right message to the people of the state of Utah and to women, young women particularly. You don't have limits uh, on your ability to serve publicly in high-profile positions, elected positions, that may people may have felt were in the place in the past. We're moving in the right direction on this. I think that there is a 
perspective that women bring that isn't radically different in many ways, but it's subtle and it's nuanced. And I think their approach to problem solving many times is different. So I, I welcome that. Uh -huh. So it's even worse when you break it down by party because only nine of those 31 have been Republican women. So Deidre Henderson and Ann Milner uh, right now are the eighth and ninth Republican women in the history of the state to ever be elected to the Senate. They're both great legislators. And, you know, when Dan Lillenquist resigned from the state Senate uh, seven years ago, that's how I got in as a midterm vacancy, there were eight Republicans that jumped in to replace him, all men. And so sometimes it's not just that the voters uh, or the delegates are rejecting women. Sometimes women aren't running for those seats. Um, and I think that's why the real women run, I think, uh, emphasis recently has been so important. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole, you're interviewing some of these great uh, female legislators, too, that, that are in significant positions right now. And so tell, tell me kind of how your conversations are going with them, the, the impact, and kind of the future, because I, we need this to continue. Yeah, I think there's an excitement this year. Um, you, like you said, the the most the record number of women in the legislature this year, but it's still only 20, 24%. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, when you talk to female legislators, they have a lot of the same concerns that the male lawmakers do. They're concerned about what's happening in their community. They're concerned about dealing with the growth of the state. Same issues. We're all worried about the same things. But like you said, I think I think there is sort of a subtlety that that women bring to the process. That um, you know, they're they're concerned about the same things, but. They um, are sometimes not. <laughs> it's funny because a lot of times women in, in media and nationally you hear them um, called out for being too emotional. I think actually there are a lot of men lawmakers on the Hill that are sometimes too emotional. But, and we've but, already seen that this year. Nicole makes a good point. So don't expect that every woman is going to think like every other woman because our two uh, uh, kind of aggressive abortion pushing the envelope bills, they're being run by Carrie Ann Lisenby and Cheryl Acton, both women, Republican mm -hmm. women in the House. and so. So we have con great conservative women, we have great liberal women, but it doesn't always cross like people think it would. Jason, I would add one thing. We've got coming up in 2020, the 150th anniversary of Utah granting women the right to vote. That occurred in uh, 1870. There's a group, Better, uh, Better Days 2020, 2020 yeah. that is putting together some information and publicity about that. It's a wonderful thing to celebrate, though. And I'm very proud of our Utah heritage. And people think of Wyoming as the equality state in the sense that they were the first ones to grant women the right to vote in a national election. But Utah as a territory in 1870 was ahead of Wyoming on this issue. We have a lot to be proud of in terms of our history, in terms of women and being involved in, in politics and in voting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, can we turn to a few bills? Sure. We'll run through a few. You have some of your own that you want to talk about. Let's talk about a couple of air quality bills, two, two in particular that are kind, of, are kind of rising in the conversation right now. One is giving cities the power to in, enforce their own uh, idling laws, right? They say lots of times people are sitting in front of schools waiting for the kids, the cars are running. All right, so that's one. And the second one that I want to address is kind of the, the cash for clunkers program. There's a two right there. Yeah, so, so let me start off on that one. That's Representative Jeff Stenquist. He's mm -hmm. brand, brand new legislator uh, running the, the modified Utah cash for clunkers. But what most people don't realize is 20% um, tw of our cars uh, on the road are tier zero or tier one. They're older cars. And they're producing 60% of our uh, vehicle emissions. And so if we could even take half of those cars out of the road, that, that has a significant effect immediately on, on our air quality. And so I think uh, th it's an incentive program. It's not quite the full cash for clunkers, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I do too. I, I think the important thing also for people to know is this is an example of the Utah State Legislature, including the governor's office, uh, at, the governor's office added to the Utah State Legislature, working effectively on bipartisan lines. Republicans and Democrats have worked on this in the last five or six years aggressively. Senator Weiler's been at the forefront of that. Representative Arendt, Patrice Arendt, has been at the forefront from our caucus. We've accomplished some great things, more in the last five or six years than we accomplished in the 100 plus year history of the state of Utah to clean up our air before that. And we've done it by working together in a way that is different from Washington, D.C., and I think is very commendable. The other thing that I think is critical for people to understand is this is all incremental. We've made great strides. Our air is actually cleaner today than it's been at any time in our lifetimes. And uh, it's because largely, more than anything else, it's because of federal air standards on cars reducing 
emissions and particulates that come out of tailpipes over the last 40 years. That's gone a long way uh, toward increasing our air quality, improving our air quality. We can continue to do that because about half our air quality problems come from tailpipes. So with tier three gasoline, the kind of thing that uh, Representative Stenquist is running, that Senator Weiler talked about, the kind of efforts that we've got to build mass transit, uh, the kind of efforts that we've got that you referenced earlier to allow for greater local control and reducing idling, all these things move us incrementally in the right direction, but we're still stuck with our geography. It's going to be something that we have to keep after for year after year after year. The only question on bills like this is they cost money, mm -hmm. and Governor Herbert has asked for $100 million for air quality. The only question I have is the legislature controls the purse strings. Will they cough up that money? That sounds like an expensive program. That's a great yeah. question. It, it won't be a hundred million, but I think it'll be something more than we've ever seen before. Yes. So that's I, my I guess. agree. Yeah. I think it will be not a hundred million to your question, Nicole. I think though that the, the governor's moving in the right direction, putting pressure on the legislature to get that number as high as possible. And I think most legislators are going to work hard to get that number. Are you seeing any, any other effort, efforts from the legislature on that hundred million dollars, at least the governor's pushing? Yeah, I forward? actually sit on a, on a review committee. We're looking at a, a, a we've got all kinds of ideas of how to spend that hundred million dollars, but I don't think that hundred million will, will really materialize. So. Okay, very good. Let's talk uh, about uh, beer for a second, all right? Nicole, help us make make sense of what the change is, right? Utah currently has 3.2% uh, right. beer in the grocery stores. There's a move to change that to 4.8. Help us understand why right. this move. So the state is kind of being forced into this because um, the limit right now is 3.2% alcohol by weight in grocery stores and on tap, like you said. The entire country basically has moved away from that. This is a, a business bill. So these giant billion dollar beer manufacturers like Anheuser-Busch, they're not making this 3.2 beer anymore because it's such a small market. Why would they continue to make this one special product for this one little state? Um, so they, um, the, the bill's being run by Senator Jerry Stevenson. It would raise the limit to 4.8% um, for grocery stores and on tap. Most states, I think, have 5%, so it's still a little bit below the national, the, the regular, but um, I think it passed this week unanimously through committee, which kind of surprised me, Senate committee. We'll see how it fares yeah. when it gets to and, the and House. The reason that's significant, and I, I get so tired of people saying that the legislature is full of minions that does whatever the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints tells them to. This bill is opposed by the church. Uh, Jerry Stevenson is an active member of the church. He passed it unanimously through, through the Senate Business and Labor Committee yesterday. But I want to push back on a little bit of what Nicole said. So we've been, as a legislator, I've been told for two years now uh, that we have to change this right now because we're, that this beer is drying up. Go to any beer cave at Maverick. There's plenty of 3.2 beer. And, and I've been assured by, um, by industry reps that, that that's not going to change because when you make beer, you have to do certain runs. And it's not that big of a deal for them to do a 3.2 run. What we're being told, I think, realistically, is the flavors and the and the packaging. So maybe you'll have to buy a 12 pack instead of a six pack. And so I think this bill will probably sail through the Senate. I think it's gonna run into some real trouble in the House. And Representative Tim Hawks, who's the rules chair, is leading the charge against this change, at least this year in the House. So that's gonna be fun to watch. All right, we'll watch that one closely. Uh, uh, Representative King, let's, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Carol Spackman Moss, uh, has some legislation about using our mobile phones while we're driving. Right. All right, this is something we've seen for a couple of years. Years. People do that. They, they <laughs> apparently I they saw you on the they, way up. No, you don't. Did not. Yeah. Stop lying. Yeah, I'm sure, he did not. But the, the law currently, it's you know, legal you, right now. So you, you can right now, but you can't be pulled over. You can't, uh, and you can't type on it. You can look at it. You, you can look yeah. at it, but but you know, it's sort of a secondary offense too, yeah. right? So you're not going to yeah. stop. Uh, just her, hers just, makes illegal the use of a handheld device. If you can, you can talk on the phone, but you can't hold the device in your hand. I think it's a public safety issue. Uh, my district is, is is pretty clearly in favor of that. I'll be voting in favor of it. But this is an interesting issue where you have the sort of get the government off my back folks uh, running up against the public safety folks in a way that creates some real conflict. Uh, this bill has been run in the past. It hasn't passed yet. It's a little like some of the other public safety issues. We had mandatory child uh, seats in cars that tried for two, three, four years and finally got passed when public safety advocates prevailed. Is that gonna happen here? I think there's a good chance of it in time. I don't know whether it's gonna pass this year, but I think in whether it's two or three years down the road or this year, mm -hmm. I think it'll end up passing just because public safety says, look, it's a pretty significant factor in careless and distracted driving. Uh -huh. So Nicole, uh, the Hinckley Institute did our own poll on this issue. 76% of Utahns said they would support a bill like this. Is that true? <laughs> 
I mean, because uh, so, you know, it seems to be a huge problem you in know, this state. We all we all say we support it, but I think most of us are guilty of it. Um, I know I check my phone at red lights, but I think um, I think it is interesting and it does show some movement. Although she had it heard in a different committee this year, um, I think that might have been had some. Uh, some part of its success. But um, I think also it would look very hypocritical for the legislature to not at least give this a fair hearing in, in, some, in the House in the, in, uh, before the full House when uh, a couple years ago they lowered the DUI limit to 0.05. If we're really concerned about preventing uh, road accidents and we lower the DUI limit, I think that this should definitely be something to consider as well. And you know I'm not opposed uh, to this bill, and, and I'll probably support it if it makes it to the Senate. But I want to point out, if you look at our traffic da deaths and our, even our traffic accidents, it's not like they're going up with cell phone usage. In fact, I think they're going down. I think that, you know you, you need to weigh that into the balance as well. So. Okay, very good. Before we leave the legislative session, Representative King, any legislation that we haven't talked about that's going to get pretty interesting in the next couple uh, days to weeks, we should talk about. Well, you'll see the abortion bills. I think get some traction. Uh, we already have. One uh, Representative Lizenby's bill dealing with Down syndrome mm -hmm. moved through the Judiciary Committee earlier this week. I was on that committee, spoke against it, voted against it, but uh, it passed out of committee. We'll hear it on the floor of the House, undoubtedly. Last year, the same thing happened, and it got stuck. It didn't end up going to the Senate. They didn't debate it. No, no it, it, it went through a Senate committee, and then and then the president wouldn't allow it on the Senate floor. On the floor. So. It didn't have a floor vote in the Senate. I don't know how far it'll get uh, in the House or the Senate. I anticipate it'll probably pass the House again because it's watered down. It's a trigger what, uh, What's step. left? Yep. So, so what's left is a bill that says you can't have uh, an abortion if the reason for that is solely because of a diagnosis of Down syndrome, and it's only going to take effect if and when the Supreme Court legitimizes uh, 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 criminalizing abortion. So you don't have the constitutional concerns this year that you did last so year. So last year's bill would have triggered it, so Utah is filing that lawsuit. That would have cost taxpayers a million to two million dollars, and it's pro probably a losing proposition based on our, our current law. This, year bill, this year's bill says we're going to sit on the sideline and we're going to wait and see if another state wins that lawsuit, then we'll mm -hmm. jump in. Uh, the other thing is this punishes doctors who perform the abortions because it doesn't punish the women who ask for the abortions, it punishes the doctors if they perform them, which is an interesting kind of sidestep around the law right now. So. Very good. Hey, Nicole, what are you watching? I think um, we have a lot of interesting proposals to amend the state constitution this year. There's one that would make it gender neutral, remove he and his and put in people and persons. Um, there's also the anti-slavery one that would abolish the small provision in the state constitution. I would hope that that would pass the legislature unanimously. It's already gone through the Senate unanimously. And um, those, of course, will have to be on the ballot next year mm -hmm. so. So we're watching those closely because yeah. we'll have a chance to actually follow through with those right. particular provisions. It's very good. Senator, what about you? Well, I want to tell you about a, a sad thing. I was running a bill to extend the truck ban on Legacy Highway for another two and a half years, and that met uh, a sad fate in uh, House, our Senate Transportation Committee last night. I lost on a four to one vote. All of my Republican colleagues voted against extending the ban. My one Democrat colleague, Kathleen Reeve, voted to extend it. But the problem is, is since this ban went into place 12 years ago, we've had thousands of people build their homes They've actually built their homes with their front doors turning towards the, because it's such a tr peaceful, tranquil setting, and now we're going to have diesel trucks, you know, blowing black smoke, and so people are really up in arms. A lot of people didn't realize it was a temporary truck ban, so that's why I was trying to extend it. Yeah, it did have the end date. So, so why did the committee feel like they need to have them there? Because well, the, the this public was a, certainly does This like was it. a bitter pill. Remember, Rocky Anderson sued and halted up the construction for four or five years. It, it elevated the cost by hundreds of millions of dollars. So this truck ban was forced on the state. State, uh, through a, a settlement, and so this was a bitter pill they were forced to swallow, and they don't want to swallow it again. Mm -hmm. so, so the trucks are coming back. The trucks may be coming back. I don't know how soon it will be, but they're probably. Well, they got to get it through the house, and yeah. I do think that. No, no, no. <laughs> the ban expires. Yeah. Uh, it's in, it, the, the, it, no, my my bills would, would have, have extended, the ban in but place. the ban. If we do nothing, the ban expires on January first of next year. Right. So I mean. What we're going to have to do is either pass a new bill that deals with it in the House, or the, the things it's, stand it's, right now. It's self-executing. That's right. Yeah, there's a sunset on okay. the Okay, I want to talk for just a moment about the State of the Union address that finally did happen, just just for a moment. But I want to put this Utah uh, kind of wrapper around this. Okay, uh, we did a poll and asked a couple of questions. One, the the whether or not Utahns approve of President Trump. Forty-eight percent of Utahns approve. 
49 disapprove, but I want to put that in, in terms of a question too on what do Utahns feel about the wall? And that's what I want to understand your, your, your comments about that. Uh, for Utahns, 49% supported the wall, 48% oppose. That's just, a, you know, Representative, that's quite the split, right? Yeah. Hasn't changed much for the Utahns. Help us understand those components. Well, it's a little surprising in the sense that I would have expected anti-wall sentiment to be higher, but they that those numbers reflect feelings about uh, President Trump too. So to some extent, I think what people are saying is they're, they're making equivalent their feelings about Trump and the wall. I think generally speaking, however, Utahns are much more uh, pro-immigration and pro-dreamers, uh, for example, than people across the country. I think that the wall is a political issue that the president has been very aggressive about pushing, largely because he made it the centerpiece of his campaign, so he can't back away from it. My expectation would be that they'll work something out at the federal level. I don't think that either party, but uh, particularly President Trump and the Republicans want to see another shutdown because it ended badly for them in the last time. I expect they'll get things worked out, and I expect that's what Utahns really support is no more government shuts down, shutdowns. Let's have the political process go through what it needs to in Washington, D.C. to come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. Nicole, did that surprise you? I am surprised as well to hear that people are, um, there are more people in support of the wall, but I think like he, like a Representative King said, it is a political issue. It does reflect support for President Trump and support of not a, of President Trump. I think um, there are now talks about, let's use technology, let's do screenings mm -hmm. at um, ports of entry. I think those would be much more f fiscally responsible yeah. solutions that more people would be able to get behind. Here's what's crazy. Chuck Schumer supported the wall and so did Nancy Pelosi before Trump made it a campaign issue. But now the wall and the Trump have become kind of commingled together. So mm -hmm. I support uh, dreamers. I support immigration reform. And I also support, you know, securing our borders. I, I, I don't think they all have to be mutually exclusive. So, so why has that deal not been struck then? Um, the devil's in the details. So I, I, I think there might be a deal coming, um, or, or we're gonna, or, or I think Trump's gonna do it by executive okay. fiat. Well, so. you, you had That's a deal. Coming. You had a deal, Jason, before right around Christmas, and then the right wing media got a hold of Trump and said, No, 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 you got to stand firm on the wall, and he changed his mind. You had a hundred senators saying, Okay, we got a deal. <laughs> so it's political. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it that. Very good conversation. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for the Hinckley Report. This episode is available as a podcast. Go to KUED.org slash Hinckley Report to listen. Thank you and good night.